everybody. Uh, welcome to the impact session on harnessing technology for environmental sustainability. Today we'll be discussing tech's role when it comes to and how it can contribute to climate change, how technology from AI to logistics can have positive impact when it comes to tackling environmental challenges, how sectors can prioritize initiatives through partnerships, policy, uh, practices, and how reaching these goals will take immense coordination from both governments and the private sector, and how we can reunite the tech sector to achieve the 2030 vision. So uh, for many of you who are visiting and joining by top link, um, you can also share some of your comments as well as um, some of your questions in the uh, Zoom chat box uh, during this session. And so the goal of this session really is to explore and to provide some framing around why technology is so important in this conversation. Yes, it's helped societies and it's caused many environmental and social problems as well, but it's also that key center focus when it comes to addressing uh, the global climate change uh, challenges. And we've obviously seen record amounts of uh, uh, challenges uh, from the climate change uh, with uh, record levels of air travel that's declined, but we're still, still seeing those uh, data show up. We had almost the hottest uh, weather on record last year. And secondly, how the developments we're seeing has warranted further investments in tech and innovation. And what I mean by that is that pandemic has led to not only a global uh, health crisis, but it's also led to a global economic crisis. So making sure that the uh, public funds that are available are also getting allocated to uh, climate protection as well. And this is where also the 4IR uh, can play a vital role. So we're gonna kick this uh, session off into two sections. Uh, the first panel discussion with our speakers who you will meet very shortly, and then a more detailed discussion uh, limited to our forum members and partners uh, in a breakout session. So I wanna introduce our panel first. Uh, Inger Anderson is the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program. Uh, Pat Gelsinger is the CEO of VMware, uh, soon to start at Intel in mid-February. And Rebecca Mazizak is the CEO of TechSoup, and Diego Sazgil is the founder and chief executive officer of Pachama. So I wanted to start off with a question here to the group. Uh, we're beginning a new year with a new administration with the Biden uh, presidency uh, where climate change is gonna be a top priority. In doing so, we've also joined the plan uh, Paris Climate Accord, more EOs to come. Uh, I want to ask the group, um, how do you see technology's role in facilitating this goal? And if you can share some brief story or an experience that you had that inspired these um, actions as well. And if you could share some of those insights to the audience on what each and everyone can do to more rapidly scale technology for those global goals, whether it be the policy part, the practice part, or the partnership part. So Inger, I'll start off with you. Well, thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here. Look. Um, yes, we have a new administration in the US, but I'd like to posit that the American economy never left Paris. Uh, there might have been a federal decision to leave, but the American economy actually was in Paris. What's really good is that now we have the political leadership to move this forward, but I think it's, it's important to, to mention that. Um, and so, of course, we're delighted uh, with, with the decision uh, to, to come back in. But what we really need to think about uh, is to build that future that does not rely on coal or extractives or concrete, et cetera. We need to think about circularity. We need to understand, I, I work for the United Nations Environment Entity, right? So we need to understand we can't continue to take stuff out of the environment, our resources, put them into the economy and discard them back into the environment as emissions, as trash, as, as e-waste, et cetera. And here, digital technologies have a critical uh, role to play you know, how are we going to think about funding? How can we use technology for power plants? How can we use transportation as a vehicle service? How can we do digital financing, crowdfunding? All of these things are beginning to offer us up new opportunities. And I think it's very worth while thinking about that we in the UN and our secretary general speak about these two mega trends that we need to be mindful of. One, climate change but the other one, digital technology. Understanding these two mega trends and how they can intersect, which is part of your question, is part of this, the story of the solutions. And I, I think when we begin, you want to ask for a little story, and I'm aware that we have to do all of this in, in, in a couple of minutes, but what we are seeing in, inside games, gaming, is interesting. 
because um, you know uh, billions of people are in the gaming industry uh, and uh, uh, play games. Uh, anyone who has a teenager in their lives will know this, and so um, and 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 it offers an opportunity. And we at UNEB are working with the gaming industry to provide these digital nudges to uh, make uh, young people aware. And and for example, one of, we've worked with Ant Forest uh, by Ant Financial. They have used this so that you can put a few cents in, uh, and this then get for your energy credits of what you're doing. And this is, again gets translated into tree planting. 122 million trees have now been actual physical real trees have been planted through this. So there are a lot, and this is, I mean, a small example, but not an unimportant one. So look, there's lots to be done, um, but technology will be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Pat, um, VMware, you, re you recently released the 2030 agenda as well. Um, how do you see a tech's role in facilitating some of these goals we outlined? Yeah, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, uh, clearly, I think we all look at uh, the new administration with optimism uh, as they uh, come in. And clearly their tech agenda, uh, I think, will be uh, more significant, more aligned. And at least we now have a president who believes there might be a problem here. Right. You know, <laughs> encouraging uh, for all of us. You know, I'll start with a little bit of the story uh, and maybe two little brief ones. I was having a conversation with my daughter in law. And now with three, you know, with uh, three married children, one of them is a, a writer, so a bit of a protagonist, and she loves to debate with me. And uh, she was complimenting me on some of my accomplishments. But knowing her, of course, there was something more at work. And she says, but did you have to bankrupt my planet to do so? And it was one of those, you know, very sharp points in the conversation. It's just always stuck with me. You know, have we left the planet a better place for our children and grandchildren? Uh, the other little story was the, uh, I think it was what, uh, October 9th was the orange day in the Bay Area, right? When we saw the fires just, you know, in the smoke filled air. And from where I'm standing, literally, I could see the fires on a far ridge right, you know, almost 20 miles or so from our house uh, at that point. And we were getting notices all night long about uh, potentially needing to uh, evacuate. And I called it the triple, right? We saw the social issues, right? We saw the pandemic issues and we saw environmental issues. You know, three things all sort of cascading, right, uh, together. And it was probably the only day as we've gone through the pandemic that I actually felt very depressed. I'm a very optimistic person, but all of a sudden, all of these coming together, it's like, this is a point where, boy, no, it's not okay. And I think with that, as we think about, and I've spent my career as a technologist, and I like to think about this period of time that we're in, you know, where the superpowers of technology are greater than ever, right? As we see them lifting more and more of the economic progress of the planet, you know, as we're encroaching on, you know, and we can see in sight where we'll have literally 90% of humanity is being connected. Right, where we're seeing you know, things like cloud and AI being able to touch more and more of humanity. But can we truly say we are gonna use those superpowers of technology as a shaping, as a force for good, and particularly start to attack some of these triple issues, pandemics, social change, and climate change at scale. And obviously I'm here because I fundamentally believe that is the case. And it is not only our opportunity but I actually think it's the obligation of tech leaders to be truly shaping technology as that force for good. Yeah, and, and Rebecca, when it comes to partnerships, I mean, you, you work with so many different tech companies, so you have a wide purview and approach of those tech companies. So I'm curious uh, what your thoughts on all of that. Thank you, Sally, and thank you to the forum for uh, uh, bringing me to this panel. I'm really delighted to be able to bring a, a broad civil society perspective to this important topic. Uh, TechSoup is a nonprofit network that operates a platform to bring tech and resources from 100 corporations and 400 foundations to civil society organizations in 200 countries. Environmental sustainability and other global goals can be accelerated by expanding the engagement and trust of communities and technology is a key enabler. Uh, my remarks today are really inspired by the 11,000 community-based organizations focused on environmental sustainability who are reached by TechSoup's platform. 
as well as the hundreds of thousands of community organizations we reach who focus on societal issues exacerbated by climate change and other environmental issues. These tend to be smaller organizations whose names you may not recognize, yet they are deeply engaged with their local communities. And it is this last mile where community organizations shine that inspires me and holds significant potential. I'd like to share one example. Uh, Makaya, a civil society organization, has led diverse projects in Colombia and regionally for 14 years to strengthen uh, capacities for social development through cooperation, technology, and innovation. They saw opportunity for multi-stakeholder impact from a regulatory change making TV white space technology available for internet access. Makaya focused on farming communities in historical conflict zones they brought together local government members and corporations such as ALO and partners, Lavaza, Microsoft and SAP. And they engaged other civil society organizations to train young people on sophisticated digital tools for advanced fleet management devices, market information and soil water and air monitoring tools. They did so without leaving behind the farmers who had been there for years. Makaya also followed a similar model to bring internet access and training to rural schools and with another project to help citizens learn how to use coffee cup sized air uh, sensors to collect air quality data and influence local government decision makers. These last mile human connections demonstrate how the impact of environmental sustainability initiatives is enhanced by trusted relationships and people who have firsthand knowledge of needs and personal stakes in the intended outcomes. We see that three actions are essential to establish this type of meaningful engagement through civil society organizations. First, enable two-way sharing of information, not just to communities, but also from. Engage civil society in the implementation of regulations and the design of solutions. They see the gaps and they know how to fill them. And third, uh, engage civil society organizations in monitoring the impacts and reporting the unintended consequences of policies, regulations, and solutions. Investing in these engagement models and in digital infrastructure that includes civil society organizations in these new ways represents a significant opportunity to accelerate environmental sustainability. Thank you. And that's a great um, way to segue to Diego. Uh, Diego, your company, Pachma, and I'll, I'll have you explain a little bit more, um, is a machine learning company uh, that uses LiDAR technology uh, to, uh, to cure, uh, accurately verify carbon capture by forest. So uh, by that, my assumption is that um, a lot of government participation is needed. Um, do you have any thoughts on what Rebecca had also said and, and also just from your purview, what your thoughts are? Yeah, thank you, Sally, and thank you, uh, Davos, for inviting us to participate. Uh, at Pachama, indeed, we use artificial intelligence to analyze satellite images of the forest worldwide and be able to estimate how much carbon forest sequestered, monitor projects that are either conserving or restoring forest as a solution to climate change. And uh, we work with co corporations such as Microsoft and Amazon and Shopify that are looking to achieve net zero uh, by supporting projects that are removing carbon from the atmosphere. And you know what we're seeing is that yes, technology plays a fundamental role on bringing transparency, accountability and efficiency uh, on these uh, markets. Carbon markets have an enormous potential to drive funding to uh, the necessary solutions to climate change but we do need uh, all the latest technologies at the service of making these markets work effectively. Uh, in terms of a story that inspired us, uh, you know, this idea actually came when I was uh, visiting uh, the Amazon rainforest in Peru. I'm originally from Argentina. I was doing a trip with my brothers and we met several landowners that uh, knew that they could uh, participate in carbon markets, but uh, they had the big barrier to entry to the market of having to hire consultants on, or auditors to come to the forest to uh, do the carbon assessments. And uh, meanwhile, we have you know, uh, an explosion of satellite data that is available uh, to do uh, analysis of the forest. Um, so, and, and now with COVID, you know, auditors can actually not go to the forest to do the assessment. So COVID has provided an acceleration of uh, the need uh, for, for the use of the latest technologies to to address these issues. So yes, excited about the new administration, excited about 
the acceleration of the adoption of technologies on uh, solving climate change. And uh, Inger, based on the conversation we just um, heard from our panelists, what is the, um, what's the UN's uh, strategy when it comes to accelerating some of these partnerships from private and, and uh, public? Well, well, I mean, we just heard an excellent example exactly of where the UN and technology meets beautifully, because obviously these carbon deals are done how under the Climate Change Convention, because why? Because we agreed in Paris to drive towards 1.5. So it does take um, it does take these actors. We in UNEP and in the United Nations speak about these three planetary crises: the climate crisis. We've heard good examples. The pollution and waste crisis, again, think plastic, think waste in the oceans, etc., which also needs technology, technology solutions, and the bi biodiversity and nature crisis. Again, where are we losing nature? What species are we using? How can we use local uh, uploads of data and information to, to help us understand how we are spending, overspending our natural capital at too high a rate? So. Um, the example that we just heard um, is, is really great because we need to use that kind of technology in monitoring and data. And here, you know, in, in, in the United Nations Environment Program, this is exactly what we're going to be doing. And we, we've uh, established a new strategy that we're rolling out. We have the big assembly uh, a couple of weeks from now with a global environmental data strategy dimension. And, and, and inside of that, um, we really want to, on the one hand, um, democratize environmental data. We host an enormous amount of data, as you can imagine. We are proud to host the IPCC. We're proud to host IPCC's twin, which deals with biodiversity, called IPES. We do the, the chemicals assessment. We do all of these assessments. This data needs to get out there, and people need to be able to understand it. And then they need intermediaries, just such as what we heard, so that we can monitor transparently and hold to account companies that are leaning in. Because, but at the same time, and there's that to-do item for the technology industry, we need to be mindful that e-waste is something we can no longer afford. We uh, produce about 50 million tons of e-waste a year 50 million tons of e-waste a year. That is equivalent to all commercial airlines ever made. But we do that every year. So we cannot just throw that into the garbage. We need to mine our waste and have that circularity. And that's part of the challenge that we are working with many governments on, as well as with companies, um, precisely to land some of these solutions. Yeah. When I think of another challenge um, and looking at it in the lens of um, corporations, Pat, is, you know, we briefly discussed VMware's um, vision for uh, 2030 agenda and, and some of, um, and, and I'll highlight some of the goals that you have is reducing carbon emissions and funding low carbon sustainability projects around the world. That's two of, from many of the things you outlined. Um, it also seems like you guys are moving away from CSR. It's actually being implemented in businesses. So um, one is, and I know there's a lot of executives in the room and in the audience. Um, how have you been able to convince your executives to get on board? Um, so it's a business decision, not just a PR decision. Um, and then the other question is, the big question is, will you be implementing something similar? And how do you uh, think about this in your new role um, as CEO of Intel? Yeah, thank you. And maybe, you know, before we talk a little bit about the 2030 goals, a little bit of the 2020 goals was a good, I'll say, canary in the coal mine to what we could lay out for 2030. Because, you know, the company and, you know, we had done this earlier in my tenure. I've been CEO of VMware for eight years and we had our 2020 goals and they were around RE100, right? You know, some different aspects of our, uh, you know, power savings, efficiency, some overall megaton goals for carbon reduction. Um, and all of these, we, you know, built into the culture of the company, right? Our values. And in that sense, and so the first piece of guidance I would give to any leader is this has to be seen as integrated into, you know, and I, I call the values of the company, the soul of the company. You know, it's who you are and you have to be reinforcing and building that. So when you try to then say it becomes a business responsibility, it can't be this other thing, 
right? You know, it already has to be part of who you are and what you're trying to accomplish as a business. So building it into the culture and values gives you that foundational element that you can actually say, now let's build these next set of goals. And as we've laid out our 30 goals for 2030, a lot of that's inspired around the uh, UN objectives that have been laid uh, out, but also contextualized to our business. And, you know, if you look at the 30 goals, you know, some of them, we have no idea how we're going to accomplish them. You know, they're just these big audacious goals that are out there. Others, we have very firm roadmaps. Okay, we know what we're going to go do and how. So it's this composite of aspirational goals. It's ones that we have very specific objectives uh, against. You know, and then we're building them into the each of my BU and GM leaders has a piece of that that they're responsible for in their business as well. And we manage the company a quarterly cycle as many companies do that uh, we have the objectives of the company, the CEO report card that I report out you know, to the board, but also bind to all of our bonuses, right? So if we don't do these, hey, it hurts our financial returns that we see as individuals, just like any other of our corporate objectives that we'd have. So we're building it into our business processes in a natural and funda fundamental way. And you know, for these goals, we're also then saying, and we've lined our 2030 goals across trust, equity, and sustainability. You know, so three categories that all 30 goals fit under that broader umbrella, you know, building trust, a lot of that's around uh, cyber, cyber attacks, cybersecurity. Can the world trust the digital platforms that we're building for every aspect of humanity, you know, equity, you know, building our diversity, inclusion, training, education, and then finally sustainability where many of these uh, topics fall. But we're also then backing that up with some crazy projects. We're saying, let's go do some really innovative things. And one of those, of course, that I'm really excited about is our establishing, you know, one of our major campuses here in California is the first microgrid right? We've built, you know, battery arrays, you know, solar panels. We're connecting it up to the power systems. We're also making it an emergency response resource for the Palo Alto community here as well. And we're sort of saying, uh, here's our crazy project that's innovative, committing capital to it. And that we're then telling others, join us in similar projects as well. So it aligns with our long-term goals. It aligns with our culture of innovation and clearly is saying we're going to move the needle in some very tangible ways that inspires one of the goals but also brings inspiration to all 30 of the goals that we're building into our business processes as well and you know i will say on the intel front obviously a much bigger company you know many different aspects and i was actually pretty encouraged to see their 2030 goals weren't all that dissimilar to what we're laying out for uh, vmware so I may not have too much unique work required to build on what they've already done, but yes, we'll be digging into this uh, very shortly. That's great. And congratulations on your new role. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, Rebecca, so uh, jumping off of what Pat had said and around culture and, and making sure that these aren't just audacious goals, but we can actually execute on these goals. Um, what do you see as the biggest barrier at this moment? Well, I'd like to make the point that I think investment in um, technology enabled partnerships to really engage civil society. I think uh, the, Pat's comments about the soul um, of these organizations, if I use that terminology, are that they do bring some really core insights and capabilities, but they're not well enabled to innovate with everyone else. Um, so just four areas of investment that I would call out. Um, we need common standards and digital platforms to help us identify who these organizations are and their capabilities so people know how to find them to engage with them. We also need scaled digital infrastructure for the sector itself, uh, common data models, common applications, um, ways to collaborate across issues and across geographies and even sectors. Uh, we need access to affordable connectivity application services and skills development because those are still not uh, always available. And we need new collaboration frameworks and engagement models that really recognize civil society groups as full partners of equal import uh, to corporates and governments in the common quest to accomplish the goals. And Diego, um, for you two sitting on your side, um, what are your thoughts on maybe the biggest barriers that you might see? 
Yes, I mean, I think we need more, more collaboration. Uh, as uh, Inger was saying before, there is so much data out there that that data needs to be utilized, right? So we need all parties to come together and share data, uh, find ways to collaborate uh, on, 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 on harnessing the latest technologies to analyze that data. And we need more talent also coming to the sector of sustainability. It's been actually great to see here in Silicon Valley a new excitement around climate tech, which is a new category in Silicon Valley. Uh, and there is a growing venture capital being invested and a lot of talent coming from uh, different uh, technology companies that want to work on climate, but we need more. We are in the biggest crisis that humanity has ever faced. So we need all hands on deck. Every engineer, every scientist should be thinking, how am I going to contribute to solving climate change? Um, and in using human ingenuity that has brought us so many good things in the world now to solve this big challenge. Yeah, and, and just in the final minute or two uh, we have, Inger, I wanted to ask you, because we've focused a lot on, on tech uh, and, and especially in the Bay Area and in the US and stateside, um, but how do you see the, the challenges in emerging countries um, in tackling some of these issues that we talked about on the panel? You know, um, in a way, I think there may not be so much of an understanding how, in fact, quote unquote, emerging countries are better off at times because they can leapfrog on over some older technologies that they, they don't have landlines. So forget about it. So go straight to uh, the next step. I live in Kenya and in Kenya, as you know, they were the first to introduce mobile money some 15 years ago, right, in PESA. Um, they have got really, I mean, the, they speak about the Silicon Savannah. Please, everybody, come and invest. Um, instead of Silicon Valley, the Silicon Savannah, there's a lot going on there. And you have really leading, bleeding edge startups and angel investors going in. And, and you have a lot of innovation happening. I don't want to be Pollyannish and and, and so on, but we do have what was in the early days on a very simple mobile phone platform, right? Uh, you could get market data for your carrots and so you knew when you should take them to market, that kind of information. So I think that um, emerging markets and uh, markets that are yet to emerge actually have embraced technology more than maybe uh, those in the hotspots of technology such as, as, uh, as uh, California might realize. And so we are one global village and that's the exciting part about this. So as we all now sit in lockdown, as we all understand this pandemic, as we've all learned about science and facts, let's use the technology, that, let's use science and facts for making those leaps into the, into the future, which are that, uh, tackling these three planetary crises that I spoke about. Yeah, well, I think that's a great um, place to end. Uh, and I wanna thank everybody on the panel today on this discussion.